Okay, thanks, Athos. And, um, you know, last year I think I got to argue against bone health. I was on the side against monitoring bone health with Athos. <laughs> this year I get to argue for a drug which there's no pediatric data at all. <laughs> so I could, um, I could just sit down. But since I already have five or six patients that I'm treating, I might as well try to rationalize why I'm doing that. And I am advised for an advisory board for another um, biologic. So do we need other biologics? And is this approach safe and effective? And are we ready to use it? So I mentioned earlier that we have um, different therapeutic targets for IBD, but, um, and that was targeted with natalizumab a few years ago, and it's still available in adults in particular, but that's kind of a whole pathway, that pathway four, that we're really not currently targeting in pediatrics. And I think Joel made a great point that more of what we want to think about is step-in therapy rather than step-up therapy, but at least in our risk cohort, most kids still kind of start at the bottom and, and work their way up to a biologic, although a small percentage come in early. And we certainly know and have heard many times from, from the REACH study where we do have a lot of evidence that blocking TNF is a very effective approach. And both the initial uh, quick response is outstanding, I think particularly if we optimize levels and dosage early on. And even a, a year into it, um, you can expect more than half of your kids to be in remission. And when we did the um, comparative effectiveness study, we also found that an early anti-TNF could lead to very good um, one-year outcomes. Now, there are two problems that we struggle with with this approach, though, that gives us an unmet need. Are there certainly adverse effects that we worry about? Um, in reality, the more common one that we worry about are infections and serious infections. But there's also this very rare risk of lymphoma and other very rare, serious, adverse events. And then the thing that we really struggle about that we were talking about earlier today and at all meetings is how do we maintain this response? And we know that in reality, no matter what we do, we have a good number of patients who lo lose their response to this very effective class of medications and still need something else. And this is just data from Jeff Himes from several years ago about kind of um, loss of response and kids coming off infliximab and in real world experience over time. Now, uh, Bill Sanborn and Ed Loftus published a really nice algorithm several years ago about what to do when your patient loses response to anti-TNF. Some patients, as we've heard, have high levels of antibody, undetectable anti-TNF levels. You actually have a good chance of getting that response back with another anti-TNF agent. But we certainly have patients who have plenty of anti-TNF, whether we're measuring infliximab or adalimumab, and, and do have active disease when we reevaluate them, and all, ideally we would want an alternative approach. And, and honestly, that's fairly limited at this point. So if we come back to this, this target of blocking uh, white cell adhesion and recruitment, um, you know, this has been looked at in two different ways. Uh, natalizumab, which came out first, um, tended to block recruitment more widely, and it was thought that that was accounted for some of the rare um, CNS side effects with the JC virus. Uh, vetalizumab, which we'll talk about today, um, seems to be more gut selective, so at least maybe more safe in that respect. Um, now, I was also given uh, the opportunity to argue for a medication where you can hardly see the response there, um, but nevertheless, these are the data at this point, and I think a lot of this is that we'll have to get more experience with this, but at least from the clinical trials, this agent seems to have a fairly slow onset of action, and we'll see how that plays out in our own experience, and we've talked about different ways to kind of bridge to when you get the response. But nevertheless, in the Crohn's induction trial, there was a signal for efficacy with remission uh, six weeks in. And then um, for maintenance, now the thing we have to be careful about is patients got randomized to maintenance only if they had a response, but at least the responders, about 40% of them were in remission a year later. So there was a subset of patients who would go into remission and stay in remission in the Crohn's trial that was published. Um, Adverse effects, effects um, from this, and you know, actually this was a, an adult, a, a debate on the adult side yesterday morning. 
So I think this is the first time we've deba debated an agent within 24 hours and within about six months of FDA approval. But um, at least from the trials, the rates of infections and other adverse events have been very similar. Now, for ulcerative colitis, there's a feeling that at least for patients with not very severe ulcerative colitis, this agent may have a good place in therapy. And there in the back-to-back in the -back New England report, uh, there was about a 47% response rate, 17% remission rate, um, six weeks into therapy for UC. And then again, when you looked out to week 52 in those um, responders, it was fairly durable um, with, um, you know, a good number of patients up to 52% having clinical response, 45% having clinical remission, and actually 56% having mucosal healing uh, amongst ulcerative colitis patients who had responded six weeks after starting the drug. And then again, the signal for safety so far has been quite good. I'm sure we'll hear from Joel that, you know, we always worry about only safety data from clinical trials, but at least this point, the safety signal has been quite good. Now, this is kind of the, the group of patients that we, we would probably think about the most at this point. I, I don't know who we're really going to step in with before anti-TNF anytime soon in pediatrics with vetaluzumab, so we'll still probably be looking at patients where anti-TNFs are either non-responders or loss of response with, with decent drug levels. So this study was published by Bruce Stans and Gastro this year, and, and shown in panel A is kind of the remission rates at, at week six, and in panel B, the remission rates out to week 10. And there really wasn't a signal for improvement in, in patients who had failed or were failed by anti-TNF therapy um, until week 10, when about 27% uh, were in remission, <coughs> excuse me, and, and about 39% um, had responded. So there was a signal for efficacy in a subset of patients, even if they had previously been on anti-TNF, but you really didn't start to see this until, um, you know, 10 weeks into this clinical trial. <clears throat> so I think there is a rule f role for this. I certainly, unfortunately, have plenty of patients, even with trying to use um, anti-TNF in an optimal way, that um, really are not doing well. Uh, I think where we'd want to think about this are in our patients who are active on anti-TNF therapy but have good levels. It really doesn't seem to be an issue with levels or antibodies. We're looking for an alternate mechanism of action, but because I think probably because of the slow onset of action, we'll need to know, think of ways to bridge patients. So in some of my own patients recently, I've used enteral nutrition as a bridge, I've used steroids as a bridge, but haven't really relied on only vetaluzumab by itself to quick enough get them into remission. Um, so thank you.